Good afternoon. I'm Steve Feldman. I'm the Interim Executive Director for the Mendel Center. Uh, welcome to the Mendel Center and welcome to the Sugarman Memorial Lecture in Nonprofit Law. We're very pleased uh, to host the Sugarman Lecture Series. I would like to extend a warm welcome to this year's speaker, uh, Greg Colvin. Uh, pro Professor Paul Feinberg, who teaches nonprofit law in the Mendel Center graduate program, will provide a little more background on the Sugarman Lecture and Mr. Colvin. Uh, so enjoy the lecture, and please join us for a reception in the lobby uh, following the lecture. And one other thing, uh, anyone needing CLE credit should pick up a form at the registration table, uh, complete it after the lecture, and return it to the, to the table. Uh, thank you for all, all of you for coming. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Norman Sugarman, for whom this uh, lecture is named. Uh, he was a partner in Baker and Hostetler, but he was uh, really a giant in the field. He had been uh, with the Internal Revenue Service until 1956. He rose to the level of assistant commissioner for technical. He was one of the first non-political appointees to an assistant commissioner role. He, he's, he had a big role in the preparation of the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Code of 1954. Uh, he was an amazing person. He, he knew everything in the tax law, had an encyclopedic memory. But what was, what was, most, uh, what was mo most amazing about him, he had this wonderful ability to communicate with clients and others in very simple terms, very complex things. So he was a very, very special person. He was a mentor to a lot of us. And after his death in uh, 1986, we thought the way to memorialize him best uh, was, to, um, was to have lectures on topics that, on subjects that were very important to him, the nonprofit sector, nonprofit law. Uh, and he was a leading force, uh, particularly after the Tax Reform Act of 1969, in working on various uh, regulations and other things. Uh, and he was quite a force and had a national practice. So I'm very pleased. Um, that Greg agreed to be a um, speaker today uh, because I think um, what he's got to talk about would be something that Norman would think uh, was extremely important. Uh, the program uh, lays out uh, Greg's uh, CV, which is quite extensive. I've known Greg for uh, many years. Uh, he and I are both active in the Exempt Organizations Committee of the Tax Section of the ABA. So I've had the opportunity to hear him uh, over the years on a, ver a variety of topics, all mostly dealing with uh, advocacy, uh, advocacy issues. And uh, I would say this, and I think, you will, I think you'll see from his lecture, that he, he has a passion uh, about this subject. And so uh, without further ado, Greg, please continue. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. Uh, almost every other person I've spoken to since I arrived has said, have you been to Cleveland before? <laughs> and, and I had to say, no, actually, I haven't stopped and walked in the grass. Um, but I have to tell you, the night before I left, my wife said, why are you getting up so early? Where are you going tomorrow? I said, well, I'm going to go to Cleveland. She said, I, I spent a summer in Cleveland. I was an intern with the Greater Cleveland Associated Foundation. I, I don't know if it still exists or whether its name has changed, but she said, and I was, I was going door to door asking people who they were going to vote for mayor uh, during the Carl Stokes uh, campaign. And I said, oh no, it's because of you that I have to give this lecture. Because in fact, Cleveland was ground zero for some of the rules passed by Congress uh, to address political activities of tax exempt organizations. And after 1969, if you were a private foundation, you couldn't just do voter registration in one city in one election, because that's what the Ford Foundation had funded in Cleveland during uh, Mayor Stokes' election. You had to do it in at least five states and more than one election. So uh, you might say Cleveland is a bit of a ground zero for political tax law, and that's the topic of my lecture after Citizens United. Now, uh, you have many ways, traditional ways, to participate. If you hold your questions till the end, we'll have time to discuss them. There's also a reception afterwards. And the third way, I've never tried this before,
but if, you're, if you have active thumbs, you may tweet, and the hashtag is politax for today. Who knows? I will not look at these until after the lecture, but if you'd like to, to uh, register your thoughts and uh, participate in that way, you're welcome to. Well, to begin, when the United States Supreme Court announced its decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission on January 21st of this year, the immediate reaction from many was that this is going to open the floodgates for corporate spending to influence the democratic process in America. Now, this case, I don't know, I, I just ha have to say, I just finished reading it at my log cabin this morning. It is Citizens United, the book. Um, to have to read the entire um, opinion from beginning to end. But it's a case that involved a nonprofit social advocacy group named Citizens United that produced, distributed, and advertised a film called Hillary the Movie. And in this case, the court decided that the First Amendment allowed speakers in America, whether they are corporate or labor unions, whether they're federal or state, nonprofit or for profit, to advocate the election or defeat of a candidate so long as the speech was done independently of any candidate or political party. The reaction, outrage, I'm sure you've heard at the concept that corporations are persons entitled to First Amendment speech rights, shock that the uh, court took a conservative turn based on uh, a bare majority of five to four upending 100 years of progressive campaign finance reforms and overruling its own precedents, some of which were as recent as 2003 and um, in 1990. Well, my reaction to Citizens United is quite different, I have to say. It's true it will no longer be a felony for a business corporation to make independent expenditures to support or oppose a candidate, and we may therefore see a lot more corporate spending in American political um, elections. But what I find more provocative is that the court's decision lifts the lid on a steaming pot of legal issues that I've been dealing with for a long time, which is how do you define political speech in this country? Those uh, business corporations and economic interests that desire political power have pretty much figured out how to do it. They didn't need the Citizens United decision to uh, unlock their access to power. They mainly have been uh, able to use those realms of speech and spending and conduct that fall outside of the FEC uh, prohibitions, at least for their activity in federal elections. So to me, the most fascinating questions are, and will continue to be, not about who might speak to influence elections or what burdens they might have, but about what um, Professor John Simon at Yale has called border patrol. That is the exercise of critical judgment about what constitutes political speech and what does not. Where is that line? How do we know when the line has been crossed? Can we know where the line is before we cross it or come right up to it? Now, major decisions affecting uh, who can speak and what vehicles they use are generally made fairly rarely by Congress and the Supreme Court. They tend to happen once in a decade, maybe once in a lifetime. I'll give you some examples. The ban on electioneering by charities, 501c3s, that came in 1954. Federal Election Campaign Act was 1971. Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. The 527 uh, entities rose in the 1990s. Uh, McCain-Feingold campaign reform legislation, that was 2002, and now we have Citizens United in, in 2010. By contrast, my experience is that decisions about the interpretation and use and ma manipulation of speech definitions are being made every day in small shops like mine. <laughs> We have about uh, we have a law firm of about 20 lawyers, and among us, there are about six of us that spend um, some part of every day, certainly part of every week, trying to figure out how we can best represent our clients' interest in being active politically without crossing that line into political intervention. There are other small shops like like ours in Washington D.C. and Indianapolis, 
And there's also um, public agencies and private nonprofits, the FEC, the Internal Revenue Service, state election commissions, OMB Watch, the Alliance for Justice, are also trying to um, play the same game, figure out exactly where that line is. You see, even if the floodgates are now open for a corporate business spending on election speech, and no new reforms are enacted to curtail this speech, there sti still is legal compliance problems for the politically active corporations to observe. And um, the court in Citizens United left intact the requirements to make disclosures of sources of income, as well as disclaimers within the advertisements themselves identifying uh, the, the, the sponsors of the ads. And the thrust of my remarks today is really that corporate political spending is going to have tax consequences, internal revenue code tax consequences. So let's start with a, a simple hypothetical, leaving aside tax-exempt organizations for the moment. What is the federal income tax treatment of political spending by a, a straight business corporation? Let's say if Walmart which newly liberated, let's say, by Citizens United wants to spend money on negative campaign ads against every public official that's made its life difficult, can Walmart deduct those amounts from its taxable income as ordinary and necessary business expenditures under 162 uh, of Section 162 of the Internal Revenue Code? The answer would seem to be no because the section of the Internal Revenue Code says that there can be no business expense deduction for any amount paid or incurred for participation or intervention in a political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. What does that mean? You'll look in vain for much in the way of Treasury regulations or even decided cases interpreting what political intervention is under 162E. But this phrasing might sound familiar to many of you. you. You may have heard it before. And that is because these same words, just about, are also contained in the de basic definition of a 501c3 charity. You must not participate or intervene in, including the publishing or distributing of statements, any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office to qualify as a 501c3 organization. So now, after Citizens United, our friends in the corporate tax bar can join us in the exempt organizations bar and go to a bar and have a few beers and ask the same question, exactly what is political campaign intervention? Now, maybe Justice Scalia could tell us what intervention meant in 1954. I'm not sure what most people would think it, it is today. Maybe, it's, maybe intervention is when you come home and you open the door and you go in your living room and there's all your friends and family assembled and they tell you that it's time to go to rehab? That, that might be the common impression of intervention, but that's not what the tax law provides. Um, the reason why it's important for business corporations to know what is political intervention is that it's going to have to be paid for with after-tax dollars so that spending for speech that does not cross this line will be tax deductible and much less expensive. Now, when you ask the IRS officials who are responsible for this area, what is political intervention, within the first 60 seconds they're going to tell you it depends on the facts and circumstances. They're very reluctant to say where the line is. And in fact, under 501c3, there's very little in the Treasury regulations to elaborate on this term, political intervention, and there's not much case law either. The IRS has been fairly successful so far staying away from litigation uh, about various political transgressions made by charities that have occurred, and the reported cases tend to involve very explicit uh, rather than marginal violations, so that when you're doing border control, trying to figure out where that line is, you don't get a lot of help from the regulations or the cases that have been decided. Most of the guidance we have on what is and is not political intervention is in a smattering of revenue rulings from the IRS, which stopped in, about in the uh, late 1980s, and then since then there was one ruling 
actually is a fairly sizable one in 2007 that covered some borderline situations. But again, without drawing crystal clear lines. Beyond that, those of us who are trying to advise tax exempt organizations about their political activities have had to try to read tea leaves from high profile skirmishes, such as the IRS has had with the Newt Gingrich, with the Christian Coalition, the NAACP, the Heritage Foundation, All Saints Episcopal Church, the Corporation for, Publ uh, for, for Public Broadcasting is, is another one. Now, um, I think it was four years ago, uh, one of my friends, Mark Owens, who had been director of exempt organizations to the IRS, gave a talk about this same subject, political activities of nonprofits, entitled uh, The Live Wire, Touching a Live Wire. And Mark actually represented the NAACP and the Episcopal Church. And at the end of those audits, both organizations uh, essentially were let go by the IRS. Um, but in the course of that, the IRS looked at the video of Julian Bond's speech at the NAACP where he was commenting on President Bush at the time and said, uh, well, we looked at the video and we don't see any political intervention by the NAACP. They also, I guess, looked at the text of the sermon that had been given at the Episcopal Church and they said, well, we're going to let you go this time, but we think it was political intervention, uh, what you said in that speech about uh, the candidates running for office at that time, which I believe was Bush and Kerry. But they never said what elements of critical judgment led them to decide that one speech was across the line and the other one was not. That's the kind of situation that we find ourselves in with understanding uh, the concept of political intervention under tax law. So what can be gleaned from the existing authorities is that political campaign intervention covers a much broader range of election activities than express advocacy. The Buckley versus Vallejo case in 1976 essentially limited, at that time, FEC jurisdiction to those statements that contain magic words, a vote for or vote against, or their equivalent. But with the political intervention test with the IRS, uh, it could be anything that you might say or do that tends to favor or disfavor a political candidate. But there's no broad standard, there's no word formula, there's no methodology test, there's no bright lines or safe harbors. So by falling back on this vague, ambiguous facts and circumstances approach, the IRS sort of reserves the option to consider factors that are not even mentioned in its own rulings. And with that flexibility, the IRS can find violations even in situations where the organizations might think that they've complied. And they could also be lenient as they were, let's say, with um, the NAACP and the Episcopal Church in cases where the violation might seem more blatant and obvious. Well, let's look at a hypothetical situation to see how this works out in practice. The year is 2012. Sarah Palin is the Republican challenger to Barack Obama. And let's say that in this election, we have, among many other players, two corporations that uh, care about the issue of oil and gas drilling. Um, I didn't realize until yesterday that this is Earth Day. So of course, we should take up an environmental issue that seems to divide the candidates. Both these organizations, one is a for-profit corporation, the Friendly Fossil Fuel Company. The other one is the Healthy Environment Council, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, and both would like to influence who gets elected. And the first example to discuss political intervention is this. Let's say that there, um, each of the organizations puts out a television ad about drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And they're broadcast nationally in September 2012, two months before the election. The business ad features news clips of Sarah Palin sounding intelligent and persuasive. And the Healthy Environment Council uh, broadcast advertisements that make her sound incompetent and ridiculous on the issue of hunting down the wildlife. 
what is the current federal law that would evaluate these kinds of television ads? Well, it's contained in Revenue Ruling 2007-41 for charities, for the 501c3s, <clears throat> and we would believe after Citizens United with more latitude for business spending on elections, the IRS is likely to apply a similar standard. And there are seven parts to the test for issue advocacy under Section 501c3. And the elements are whether the statement identifies uh, a candidate for an office, whether it expresses approval or disapproval. This is um, in page six of your materials, by the way. You don't need to, I don't see anybody taking notes, but you don't need to because it's uh, pretty much uh, all written down in your, in your handout. Uh, whether the statement expresses approval or disapproval for the candidate's positions, whether the statement is delivered close in time to the election, whether the statement makes reference to voting in an election, voting or to the election itself, whether the issue is a, a wedge issue that has been used to divide the candidates, whether the communications are part of an ongoing series or whether this is really the first time that the organization has advertised about this issue to the public. And then finally, whether the timing of the communication is related to a non-electoral event, such as a vote in Congress or some executive action. So if you apply Revenue Ruling 2007-41 to these hypothetical facts, and then you add up how many factors appear to be uh, good or bad with respect to political intervention, it kind of goes like this. Yes, it does identify Sarah Palin by her name, her image, and her voice. It doesn't say she's a candidate for president, but we don't know whether that matters. She is identified uh, a, as, uh, as a person, and, and uh, certainly the viewers will know at the same time that she is a candidate. Secondly, the um, ads, each in their own way, imply approval or disapproval of her positions on uh, drilling in Alaska. Thirdly, um, go back again to this list of, of um, factors, is September close in time to the November election? You know, the FEC has a fairly clear standard. 60 days before the general election is considered a time within which television broadcasts get special scrutiny. But the IRS, they don't have a number of days. It's, quote, close in time, unquote. Fourthly, uh, neither ad does make uh, reference to the election or to voting, so that would be a good factor. Oil drilling has been raised um, by many people, I guess, as an issue distinguishing the candidates, and so it appears to be a wedge issue, although there's a lot of issues that you could argue over whether they're actually a wedge issue between candidates or not. And let's assume that both organizations have a long history of mass media communications about drilling in Alaska. So it's not the first ad that either of them broadcast, but maybe they've never mentioned a political candidate before, and they're spending vastly more money this time. So it's not clear how you'd evaluate that particular criterion. And let's just say that the timing of the uh, broadcast is not related to a non-electoral event. There's no specific vote uh, or decision about um, drilling in Alaska that's coming up. And Sarah Palin is not governor of Alaska anymore, and she wouldn't have any official government function to exercise anyway. So it couldn't be described as some kind of grassroots lobbying. When you add this up, out of these seven factors, Four of them, maybe five if you consider it to be close to the election, indicate that there's political intervention. But what we don't know is whether you can just add up these factors and see which factors in the majority or whether some carry more weight than others or whether the reference to uh, elections and voting is particularly more weighty than the other factors. And so really what I'm afraid that this uh, balancing test uh, does is describe an area of risk. In other words, if you have too many bad factors, then maybe you should stay generally away from this kind of advertising. Otherwise, you will cross the line into political intervention. It's not a precise test. Also, since the IRS says all facts and circumstances need to be considered, 
There could be other factors besides these seven that are taken into consideration. Then where are you? What if Sarah Palin is chairman of the board of the uh, oil company? Uh, what if there's just been a massive oil spill or a collapsed oil rig in the North Slope? What if the ads run only in Alaska? What if they run in Ohio, which is considered a battleground state? Would that tip the balance in favor of this being political intervention? Well, I think it's time that we ask the question, should the facts and circumstances approach continue? Or should we move to something more precise? Well, we can learn something from reading the majority opinion in the Citizens United case, because R Revenue Ruling uh, 2007 was exactly the kind of balancing test that seemed to give the majority heartburn. Um, repeatedly, uh, Justice Kennedy's majority opinion talked about the nationwide chilling effect of the FEC's unique and complex rules on 71 distinct entities, 33 different kinds of political speech, 568 pages of regulations, 1,771 advisory opinions, and he even was critical of the fact, and I take this personally, the First Amendment does not permit laws that force speakers to retain a campaign finance attorney in order to interpret the laws. Well, it's bread and butter for some of us. <laughs> and certainly if there's enough money involved, of course you should get legal counsel. Well, in any case, you can sort of see the point that for uh, many organizations, charities, small charities, uh, medium-sized charities, and businesses as well, they should be able to have rules that are simple enough to follow that you don't always need to have a lawyer. There should be some common sense clarity to them. At least that's my opinion, and I, I have to say what uh, Justice Kennedy said in Citizens United seems to re represent the same sort of frust uh, frustration. Uh, ambiguous and vague regulations with open-ended rough and tumble factors are tantamount to a prior restra restraint on speech and the majority worried that speakers, whether they're business corporations, for-profits, or individuals, would simply choose to abstain from protected speech rather than commence a protected lawsuit to find out years later whether they had crossed the line or not. In fact, uh, it does appear, if you compare a Citizens United decision to a decision two years earlier in the Wisconsin Right to Life, that two justices, uh, Roberts and Alito, may have been influenced by the problem of vague and ambiguous regulation to move to, to form the majority uh, that um, dispensed with the prohibition on corporate spending. Um, because in Wisconsin Right to Life, which involved another kind of advertising that was fairly characterized as grassroots lobbying, but it did mention someone running for office within 60 days before the election. And Justice Roberts' opinion in that case said that we're not going to throw out the prohibition on corporate spending. We're going to uh, use an as-applied uh, analysis and determine that if the FEC can make rules that distinguish clearly between grassroots lobbying and speech that uh, has um, is the functional equivalent of express advocacy that has no reasonable uh, purpose except to influence uh, people on how they should vote, then that would be a clear enough line to preserve the prohibition on corporate spending and not dispense with it. Well, two years later, it appears that Justice Roberts and Alita, Alito are ready to get rid of the entire regulatory scheme, again, because of the complexity and difficulty of following it. Now, how does this affect 501c3 nonprofit corporations? We don't know whether the court in a future test might invalidate this 1954 statutory ban on political intervention by 501c3s. There is a previous um, US Supreme Court case called 
Reagan versus Taxation with Representation, 1983. It didn't involve political activity, it involved lobbying, but the question was raised, is it constitutional really for Congress to limit the amount of lobbying that a 501c3 can do as a condition of ex exemption? And the court decided, uh, yes, it was appropriate for Congress to do that because, in fact, the tax deduction that's available for those who give to 501c3 organizations is really a form of subsidy. It's, it's a cash grant um, that supports the activity of the charity, and therefore the Congress can decide to condition the benefit of this kind of, quote, public funding by saying, no, it can only be used uh, in a very small way, in substantial way for lobbying, and uh, also by, by uh, logical extension, uh, none of that funding could be used for political intervention. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of the subsidy theory. That could be another whole lecture. What is the appropriate tax policy for the special status of 501c3 organizations? Is it a subsidy or is it some other theory? But I will tell you that I, I, I believe that the business tax law and the charitable tax law have one unifying theory that explains why you would treat political intervention in the way that it is treated under the code, and that is this. All of us, all taxpayers, are expected to pay for political speech after paying our income taxes. So if you're in business and you have a certain gross revenue and you deduct your business expenses from that, you have net income, you pay taxes on, on that net income, and then you could use what remains for your personal or partisan political interests. And likewise, for charities, uh, those who give to charities should not be uh, making those contributions with the uh, possibility or the expectation that they would be used for political purposes. In fact, uh, in fact, the uh, 501c3 prohibition uh, really results in an in a equal tax treatment for money that you have decided uh, you're going to spend for political purposes. You can only place it in an organization that will not give you a tax deduction. So it's that principle of if you're going to pay for political activity, you have to pay for it with after-tax income. Where bright, Brian, excuse me, where bright lines are needed in the tax code with respect to nonprofits are really, in my view, in these three important uh, locations. One is what we've discussed, the, the business expense deduction under 162E. Secondly, the prohibition on 501c3 charitable organizations. And then thirdly, I, we haven't discussed this yet in this lecture, but for other 501c organizations, C4s, 5s, and 6s, a C4 would be a social advocacy organization like the Sierra Club or the AARP. Um, C5s are, are labor unions. C6s are trade and professional associations. You know, they don't get the benefit of tax-deductible charitable contributions, and so they can do unlimited amounts of lobbying, and their political activity um, can go up to a level that is considered less than primary. But we don't know, again, because the IRS does not have a clear standard what less than primary is. Is that 49 percent? Is that something insubstantial that's more like 15 percent? We don't know. We don't even know whether that standard is one that can be applied by measuring the dollar expenditures of an organization to determine whether they're primary. So. I, um, I believe that in order to have a consistent degree of clarity across the parts of the Internal Revenue Code that affect uh, spending by tax-exempt and taxable organizations, you need to get all three of these uh, interpretations clear and consistent. Now, I'm not to, in the interest of time, I want to get right to the, my, my own uh, suggestion for a reform, but I want to mention, and, and if you are interested in following it up further, uh, on page 
10, I believe it is. No, not page 10, but page... Fifteen, I refer to a case called Big, uh, Big Mama Rag, which was a radical feminist publication that uh, in the early 1980s uh, actually won a case against the IRS for um, the fact that the IRS had vague and ambiguous standards defining what is educational. And um, while the case did not go to the U.S. Supreme Court, it was decided in the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. The result was that the IRS's denial of tax exemption to Big Mama Rag was reversed because of the fact that the standard was so vague. Thereafter, the IRS um, published something called Revenue Ruling 86-43, which defined an educational methodology test that uh, it was really a word formula that, that allowed publications like Big Mama Rag and others to be able to know whether their publications were educational according to the IRS standards or not. And you can read, it's a f just a one-page um, methodology test that says to be educational there has to be a factual foundation. You have to engage the reader or the listener in a learning process. You have to consider the audience and not use um, well, and not rely solely on inflammatory or disparaging comments. So that was how the IRS was able to um, put forward a bright line test that passed the constitutional muster in the future. Well, let's get on to my reform proposal because I, I, I do think that the degree of vagueness and ambiguity can be dramatically reduced. Right now, I would say that the just to express it in percentages, the IRS interpretations of political intervention are about 80% vague and ambiguous. Maybe 20% is crystal clear, like if you endorse a candidate, that's intervention. Or if you make a contribution to a candidate or to a candidate's committee or to a party, that's intervention. But all of the sort of uh, speech um, fact patterns that are less distinct than that are subject to this facts and circumstances test and it, and it, is, um, it is vague. I think it's possible to get the areas of unclarity down to maybe 20, 30 percent. Again, this is just when I think about the amount of time that it takes me to explain things and try to answer questions for clients about their free speech activities. H how much of the subject matter is really uncertain and how much of it is clear? Now, I do take it as settled law for the 50 years since the 501c3 prohibition was put into place that the standard is very broad and it is be far beyond express advocacy. It covers all speech that supports or opposes a candidate for public office. And my suggestion is that we model the new test for political intervention on something that's been extremely successful in a similar area for 501c3s, and that is the bright line definitions for lobbying activity under the Internal Revenue Code. The IRS adopted in 1990 regulations that basically define lobbying as communication by the organization to government officials, which is direct lobbying, or to the public, which is grassroots lobbying, that has two components. One is that it refers to a specific legislative proposal, and secondly, that it reflects a view on that specific legislative proposal. Um, I've worked with these regulations, and there are many examples um, and a few exceptions that are contained in the lobbying regulations. And I, I find that they're about 90 to 95 percent clear. I, 90 percent of the time I can answer my client's questions without having to make fine-tuned interpretations um, of the wording. And, uh, and in fact, there have been hardly any disputes, controversies, cases about how this definition is, is interpreted um, with the IRS or with the tax court or the federal courts. 
um, because it was a very well-crafted and successful definition of lobbying activity. And one of the reasons why I think it would work in the political realm as well is that this test works for ballot measures. Do you have ballot measures in, you, you must have bonds. You have initiatives and referenda in Ohio. The IRS um, tax code test for um, whether an organization has attempted to influence the outcome of a ballot measure election is the same test. Does it refer to the initiative? Does it reflect a view on the initiative? If it does, it crosses the line and it is considered to be a lobbying activity. Now there are exceptions for um, for ballot measure uh, lobbying, one of the exceptions is nonpartisan analysis, study, and research. If you do a full and fair exposition of the pertinent facts such that a reader could come to their own conclusion, that is not considered lobbying. So the lobbying test has some um, permitted speech elements to it that allow charities to perform a, the traditional function of being able to analyze in a nonpartisan way whether this is a good or bad piece of legislation and communicate the results of that to the public. You can't do it in a 30-second TV ad, but you can do it in a booklet, or you can do it in a speech, nonpartisan analysis. And as you'll see, I, I have a similar suggestion for an exception that would allow speech in the political realm. So my proposal for how to define political intervention for business corporations and for charities and for those C4, 5s, and 6s that may not do more than, what, 49% of your activity in the political realm, that it be just as simple as the lobbying test, that it be a communication to any part of the electorate that refers to a clearly identified candidate and reflects a view on that candidate. I think that there should be two exceptions. Um, because there are other values, other social values, other speech values in, at, uh, at work here. The first exception I would suggest is that the standard allow commentary upon an elected public official that aims to influence the official's performance within his or her current term of office without mention of any election or voting or the person's candidacy or opponent. In other words, if you're just talking about the person's performance in the office that they currently occupy and you're not making any mention of the election, and it's under circumstances where it's fair to say you're trying to influence what they're doing while they're still in office, I don't see why a charity or a business should not be able to do that and get the benefit of tax deductibility. Secondly, I think there should be an exception for the presentation of information. This is like the nonpartisan analysis exception in the lobbying rules that compares the candidates gathered using an impartial methodology without express advocacy of the election or defeat of any candidate. So let's see how these principles might work out in practice. First of all, the, the uh, the, the first part of the refer to and reflect a view test is that there be a reference to a, a clearly identified candidate. There are some situations where you can put out advertising or other public speech that doesn't mention the candidate by name at all or uh, by implication. You could talk about issues. This actually occurred um, in 1984 during the Ra uh, Reagan-Mondale debates uh, there was a 501c3 organization that ran television ads that, was, that were, uh, were critical of the Star Wars missile defense system that was being debated. But that criticism of a program without mentioning either candidate was uh, considered by the IRS to be an acceptable form of speech that did not cross the line into intervention. I think if you refer to indefinite groups of candidates like we should elect more women to office or more Hispanics or, or uh, refer to people in a generic way without referring to a specific candidate for office. That should also be permitted and not be considered a part, a, a form of political intervention. 
Um, you notice the definition in the tax code of political intervention does not refer to political parties. If you were to refer to a political party, again, generically, not with respect to, say, the presidential race, but just um, talking about party activities um, that might involve many candidates, many levels of government, federal, state, and local. There is another doctrine called the American Campaign Academy, uh, set forth in the American Campaign Academy case, and I'll just summarize it for you. It basically says, uh, in, in that case, a 501c3 organization was running a training organization for essentially campaign operatives, but it was understood to be on the facts a creature of the Republican Party. Its curriculum, its teachers, the placement of its students were to benefit one of the two parties. It didn't cross the line into political intervention because they never developed a curriculum that spoke for or against any particular candidate then running for office. But the existence of the campaign training school was a improper um, substantial private benefit to a partisan interest, that is, one of the political parties. Well, just like um, providing an improper substantial benefit to Goldman Sachs or to General Motors, that disqualifies you from being a charity. So there's this other doctrine, I believe, that would apply to references and resources that are used to favor a political party, and we don't need to use the political intervention standard except in regard to specific candidates. And so some of the perhaps more shocking results of this might be that you could, as a charity or as a business, use litmus, te litmus tests. You, should say, you could be able to say, without naming any candidates, uh, that, um, and this is, this is a real case called the Catholic Answers case, that, that good Catholics uh, should not vote for a candidate that doesn't believe that life starts at conception. Or should not vote for a candidate who favors uh, same-sex marriage. Again, no candidates are referred to, but the members of a religious congregation or the public in general could be influenced, I think, legitimately by a charitable organization or by a business that they should look at the candidates and evaluate them in a certain way and that is not considered a, uh, a reference to a specific candidate. Now, some of the things I'm suggesting might seem to provide openings for a lot more quasi-political activity. And to the extent that that's occurring, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, in fact, uh, I'll agree with Justice Roberts in the Wisconsin Right to Life case. If there's a close call, the judgment ought to be in favor of the speaker. And that's what a lot of these are, is close calls. Let's look at the second element of the reflective view, of the refer to and reflective view standard. This is very strict. It means no bias, no tilt, no favoritism of any kind toward one candidate or another. It is a higher standard, as I've said, than express advocacy. Uh, and what it really means is that when you hear the messaging, it has to strike you in a neutral fashion, so you could not discern the speaker's preference for one candidate or another. Now, um, this standard could be used to evaluate advertisements, uh, signs, speeches, sermons, websites, uh, voter guides, um, asking candidates to make pledges. This is very interesting. It happens a lot. You've, I'm sure you've heard that there are organizations that believe, and they'll try to get as many candidates for public office as possible to do this, to sign a pledge basically saying they won't raise taxes. Um, if, if that is all that's going on, that a charitable or a business organization is, is asking uh, particular candidates to make that kind of pledge about policy, and then they're um, releasing the results. I think it th should be possible to do that without uh, creating a tilt or a favoritism toward one candidate or another. <coughs> one example that occurred in the last election 
All three candidates in the middle of 2008, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and John McCain were asked what they would do about Darfur, where um, there's a slow motion genocide that was continuing 2008. Many people think it's still continuing. Each one of those candidates respond to that question with a video, it's about a minute long, of what their view was on Darfur. And the Save Darfur uh, Coalition um, ran a television ad which showed all three of them saying things that were strong about the situation in Darfur. Uh, I believe that since there was no net preference expressed in that kind of advertisement, that it was a suitable way for the charity, could also be a business, to get its issue into the election and try to get actually the candidates all to speak favorably of their issue. So let's apply this Um, let's apply the standard that I have just suggested back to that Sarah Palin ad uh, about uh, drilling in Alaska. It's pretty simple. You don't need seven factors. You don't need to count them up or weigh them. Does it refer to and reflect a view on a candidate running for office? It does. Is it subject to an exception? Well, no, it's not a commentary on an incumbent's performance, nor is it uh, an impartial, impartial methodology um, used to try to educate the public. So it makes decisions about whether intervention is occurring much easier if you use this simple refer to and reflect a view standard. Let's talk about the exceptions for a moment. I should just check in on time. Uh, you know, for commentary upon an incumbent's performance, there are several classic kinds of uh, expression that are used to do this, and I believe that they can be done without intervening in an election campaign. Grassroots lobbying, certainly. I remember that the assault weapons ban expired within 60 days, actually, before the last election, and I think it should have been possible to lobby Senators Clinton, um, Obama and, uh, and McCain about their views on the assault weapons ban even though it was close to the election because each of them had a role to perform as an incumbent. Legislative scorecards that grade incumbents about how well they've done on the organization's uh, um, priority issues, this also should be permitted as uh, commentary on performance of an incumbent. Criticism and praise, of course, why not? Uh, again, as long as the election and voting uh, is not mentioned. Some words, I think, do need some work. Uh, I often have my clients um, interested in using the word, let's hold so-and-so accountable. Well, holding a candidate, or should I say an office holder, accountable could mean now that they're up for election, if they haven't performed the way we had hoped, we're going to uh, work to defeat them. But accountable can also be interpreted not to refer to the election at all, but to uh, refer to promises that the candidate made when they were running before, or to the expressed uh, polling wishes of their constituency. So using a term like holding uh, Senator so-and-so accountable can be a communication that does not cross the line into intervention. And again, like with Justice Roberts, the tie should go to the speaker, I believe. So let's um, shift the um, hypothetical a bit and consider a couple of TV ads on drilling in the Alaskan North Slope. And this time the focus is on the president, um, Barack Obama. The oil company wants the advertisement to, to reach out to the um, public and say, tell Obama to drill for energy independence. And the environmental organization puts out a television ad, the message of which is, tell Obama, keep standing up to big oil. Now, under the um, test that I'm proposing, the exception for commentary on an incumbent, I think either one of these should be OK so long as there are still decisions that he can make as an incumbent about uh, drilling. 
and it should not be considered political intervention, even though it will, uh, no doubt, on both sides, uh, draw more public attention during September, right before the election, to his position on drilling. Let's look f at impartial, impartial methodologies. I, I think it is possible to speak of impartial methodologies categorically and uh, recognize that some um, classically accepted ways of comparing candidates are appropriate for charities and for businesses um, to use as a form of non-intervention. Certainly debates. There is a IRS uh, revenue ruling that describes how debates are um, conducted to give each candidate an opportunity to answer questions that are posed by an impartial panel of, um, of questioners. And uh, even though one candidate may perform much better than the other, the fact that each has had an opportunity to uh, present their views and their answers to questions means really, I think, that the uh, an impartial methodology was used to set up that particular uh, occasion. Likewise, I think if you public if you publish factual data, um, who are the largest contributors to each of the candidates? Even that, though that may embarrass one of the candidates, they were out there soliciting the money. And and if it turns out the data shows um, that uh, one of the candidates is is supported um, very largely by energy companies, and another is supported by environmentalists. Um, that's simply public information. It's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of factual data. I think it is possible, and this is another example I want to suggest to you, that a voter guide based on a candidate questionnaire could be presented in a very even-handed, impartial way. And even though the result of the voter guide might make it appear that one candidate is more desirable than the other, if the voter guide is prepared in a way that is almost like a paper debate where any number of questions are asked, it can be a broad or a narrow range. The organization asking the question could be an environmental group or it could be a health group or it could be a, a senior citizen group. Its preferred positions may be evident, but it gives the candidates really an equal opportunity to answer questions by asking them 30 days before the election, allowing them 25 words, let's say, to explain their answers so it's not just a simple yes or no. The candidates get their opponents' answers to review before they finalize their own answers. They're published at least 10 days before the election, so it's not this sort of Sunday surprise before the Tuesday election. At least two candidates must res respond, just like having t at least two candidates at a debate. And then uh, no other information appears on the guide except the candidate's answers. And there's a disclaimer that this is not done to support or oppose any candidate. I, I think if you have a formula like this, it's a safe harbor. Any group, even though its preferred views on issues of the day might be very evident, it should be acceptable, whether, again, whether it's business or charity. So let's see how this might work in the case, again, with uh, Barack Obama and Sarah Palin. If we assume that the Healthy Environment Council has followed my prescription here for a safe harbor voter guide, and it asks each of the candidates just one question, will you renew the moratorium on offshore drilling? And Sarah Palin says no. Drill, baby, drill, forever. And Barack Obama says yes, and he gives a complex answer. As soon as 50% of the nation's energy mix comes from solar, wind, geothermal, and nuclear, assuming we can solve the waste issue, then I would renew the moratorium on offshore drilling. And let's assume the answers are published side by side in a newspaper ad, and it's obvious that, you know, the Healthy Environment Council would, would prefer the answer of the candidate who is most pro-environment. Since the safe harbor methodology was used to collect these answers, I believe that an ad like this can be published and it would not be political intervention. So um, I just want to wrap up. I welcome your reactions to the reforms that I'm suggesting here. 
Uh, when bright lines are drawn, some speech might, that might seem harmless might be captured, while other speech that might seem political to the casual observer uh, might escape regulation. And hopefully there would be less of the former and more of the latter. But do remember, these are not criminal law standards. No one goes to jail or commits a felony for crossing the lines that I'm describing. These are simply decisions that are made about tax treatment, uh, which are unavoidable. Uh, I mean, every individual and every organization has some responsibility to report to the Internal Revenue Service about its revenues and expenses and about its activities if it's a, a nonprofit organization, and judgments have to be made. So if they're made even-handedly across all kinds of tax-paying and tax-exempt organizations, I think we should be uh, able to tolerate that kind of precision. I believe we cannot stand still on this issue. I um, am in conversation with a number of, of uh, people who I've met over the years who are also concerned about the vague facts and circumstances test. And uh, some of them agree with me, some don't. But we're trying to um, further the conversation to the point where perhaps there would be a consensus of improvement um, that could be presented to the IRS. No change is needed in the congressional legislation, in the statute that describes what deduction a business corporation can take and what the requirements are for 501c3 qualification. So we don't need Congress to do anything. It's the Internal Revenue Service and Treasury that need to be, that need to be um, demanded to focus their attention. It's something that they have resisted many years doing because, I mean, it's the IRS. They, they don't conceive of themselves as an election law regulation agency. It's not their area of specialty, but they can't avoid it. And so my um, strong suggestion and strong wish is that um, a, a considerable amount of momentum could be developed to craft a complete set of bright line regulations so that all the players in our democracy, with or without paid attorneys, can easily learn these rules and take them to heart. And I thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Um, we left some time for questions. Uh, does anybody have any? We didn't prepare any. I have a question. If no one has a question, I have. Did I see a hand, anyone? Oh. Um, um, one question is, on your, your taxable income theory, um, would you say that uh, uh, C3 organizations which have unrelated net, unrelated business income should be able to use their, the proceeds from unrelated businesses if they have net income to engage in political intervention the same degree as for-profit tax-paying corporations? That's an interesting question. Uh, right now, under Section 501c3, as worded, the prohibition applies to everything a 501c3 does, not just its charitable activity, but to the extent it has unrelated business activity, that as well um, may not consist of, of political intervention. So um, I think the statute's pretty clear on that. I understand, but if you had a a more leveling of the of the playing field. Uh, yeah, you know, this has occurred to me as well. I, I, I had um, suggested to you uh, two, two exceptions, but the more I've been thinking about it, there might need to be a third exception for the kinds of business activity that are traditionally understood to be unavoidable not to make comments on political candidates during campaigns, like books, newspapers, comedy clubs, why not? Um, those who manufacture political signs and take advertising and, and run it in the media, whether it's a business organization or not, that's their trade or business. It's, it's embedded in their merchandise, and so maybe at least for the Business organizations, they should have a third exception that allows them to um, pursue a line of business uh, for the purpose of a profit that does include commentary on candidates. 
Then the question that gets interesting, Paul, is why couldn't a charity have that kind of unrelated business? If it's okay to run that kind of business as a for-profit organization and you want to have a sidelight as a charity, why should you be denied the ability to run a newspaper or publish books or um, have a comedy club in the basement of your teen center that includes commentary on candidates? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Laura. The IRS is so beleaguered these days that it seems unlikely that they're going to come out with a rational set of regulations on anything anytime soon. Do you think that this ongoing conversation might influence how um, the IRS sort of begins to, to act within the current vague, unsatisfactory regulations? In other words, they take them on as kind of sort of informal guidelines for deciding what does and doesn't cross the line? Right. Uh, it, they have been resistant, but right now, I think it depends entirely on what happens after Citizens United. If there's a huge increase in spending, and they find out uh, when they're doing audits of major energy companies, pharmaceuticals, etc., that those companies are trying to deduct the expenses of their campaign intervention, there are going to be audits and there's going to be questions about, well, where is the line for the business corporations? So now the, the uh, group of attorneys and the group of interested parties not only includes the tax-exempt organizations, but the tax-paying businesses as well. Likewise, the trade associations, which most people predict will be the emerging political voices because they can aggregate all the contributions, uh, Chamber of Commerce or, or real estate developers, and conduct political speech about elections through the trade association, they're going to have the same question. During an election year, what's their limit? What's their less than primary? What, ha, is there a 49% expenditure limit that will apply to them or not? The IRS hasn't answered those questions, but the pressure to answer them is going to come from all sides, I believe. Okay. Any other questions? Well, uh, thank you for all, com all of you for coming. Thank you particularly to my students, and I hope they did the homework I assigned, which I said review the material with that we had uh, talked about in advocacy. And I hope that uh, uh, Greg's comments and presentation uh, made that whole topic come a little more alive. We invite you to a reception afterwards where you can ask questions from Greg. And we, again, appreciate you coming today. Thank you very much.